Well, we are in the midst of a series of messages entitled, The Engaging Questions of Jesus. You know, friends, many times we think Jesus is someone who has all the answers to all of life's questions. And he does. <laughs> However, over and over in Scripture, what we see is Jesus not answering questions, but rather asking questions of us. He does so to just seek to engage us and touch deep within our souls. So for these six weeks, we're in week four today, but for these six weeks, we're going to focus on questions that the Lord uh, has for us so we uh, ourselves can probe the depths of our own souls with really the intent to fulfill our mission of just growing up healthy in God and courageous in love. Well, throughout this series, we've always already reflected on a, a number of questions, questions such as these. What do you want me to do for you? Out of Mark chapter 10. Or has no one condemned you out of John 8? Or last week, Brian talked about why do you worry out of Matthew 6. And today we're going to look at a question out of John 6. Does this offend you? Let me ask you a question. Do you ever get offended? Well, that's a silly question, isn't it? We've all been offended at one time or another. You know, you may be offended right now that I'm even asking the question, do you ever get offended? Friends, don't we live in the midst of a society where people get easily offended? Maybe it's over your political affiliation or the church you attend or the school you go to or the community in which you're involved. Maybe the worst offense lies in the football team you support. By the way, go Buffalo. You know, I'll never forget on Easter morning uh, a number of years ago at a previous church I served where someone got easily offended. You see, that, that morning we sang songs praising our resurrected Savior. We lifted up prayers of thanksgiving to a God who canceled the power of sin. I even preached a riveting sermon on Jesus defeating death. Well, unbeknownst to me, in the very back pew of the sanctuary where two people were sitting, they took offense at each other over an unkind word and a disrespectful glare. Well, after service, I find myself called out to the parking lot to break up a fist fight and all over something taken out of context on Easter Sunday. We are an easily offended people, are we not? I know people who take offense that I drink Diet Coke instead of Pepsi. Hopefully that doesn't end in a fist fight. But we're just an easily offended people. You know who else easily offended people on a regular basis? Jesus. In fact, nearly everything Jesus did when he was in this world offended somebody. The Apostle Paul in Romans 9 verse 33 calls Jesus the rock of offense. I mean, think about it. Going through the timeline of his life, his birth in a stable in Bethlehem was offensive. I mean, my, my, the Lord of glory had no business being born in a cow stall. His common heritage with man was offensive. You know, he didn't come from the high and mighty places. No, he came from lowly places. One person, upon learning that Jesus was from the little town of Nazareth, is quoted as saying in John 1, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Death on the cross was offensive, wasn't it? Jesus came and died for sinners hanging naked on a cross. How undignified, how offensive. Finally, his teachings. All throughout the Bible, we see in his teachings that people were offended. On many occasions, when people heard Jesus speak, they'd become so angry, they'd reach down, pick up stones to stone him. Others would just simply turn away and walk away. We see this in our text this morning out of John chapter 6. Let me set the stage as to what's going on here in Jesus' ministry. Jesus has just finished performing one of his most famous miracles, the feeding of more than 5,000 people with just a couple loaves of bread and a few small fish. Wanting a break from the crowds uh, to get away and, and, and spend time with his Father in heaven, Jesus heads to Capernaum on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But guess what? The crowds chase after him. Jesus addresses the crowd by basically saying, look, if you're chasing after me only to get bread to feed your bellies, you're doing the right thing but with the wrong reasons. He then goes on an interesting conversation about bread. These misunderstood people thought that, that Jesus would give them bread from heaven in a similar way that their ancestors received manna 
the bread of heaven, during their 40 years of desert wandering under Moses' leadership. Jesus, however, in John 6, points out their flawed understanding and point blank tells them that the true bread of heaven is himself. Now, confusing the people further, Jesus makes this outlandish claim that this bread of heaven, again, a.k.a. himself, will bring eternal life. Jesus then tries to clarify his claim by saying this, In uh, John chapter 6, uh, verses 53, he says, Very truly I tell you that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and then they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. Friends, to really understand how crazy this claim is, we really need to picture Jesus right now standing before us, pointing at himself, saying to a crowd of people, this is the bread that came down from heaven. (laughs) Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. I I think we can understand really how offensive and off-putting this claim by Jesus was. In fact, it was so off-putting that crowds started walking away. Even Jesus' disciples were perplexed. Listen now to this admission by the disciples and the response of Jesus. I'm going to invite Evan to share with us our main focus text this morning out of John 6. Our scripture today is from John 6. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God, the Word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious and Almighty God, I pray in the midst of these next few moments that you bless the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, that they be of profit to us and acceptable to you, for you indeed are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is a hard teaching, say the disciples. Friends, can we say understatement of the year? I mean, eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood is really an interesting metaphor. However, this morning, let's not get lost in the metaphor. Instead, let's focus on the central issue at hand. Here it is. Friends, Jesus is insisting in John 6 that we all need him. Not Jesus and something else. Not something else instead of Jesus. It's Jesus and only Jesus that we all need. You know, what makes this idea of drinking Jesus' blood all the more offensive uh, for the Jewish audience 2,000 years ago was that in their law, it forbid anyone from consuming blood of any kind. You, You see, it was believed that the blood of a creature represented the life of that creature. This makes blood sacred, right? And it gives it an atoning function. So when Jesus makes the claim that everyone needs his blood, he's saying, in a sense, you are dead. You have no life within you. Therefore, you need me. That's why Paul says uh, to the church in Ephesus in his letter to them, these words, he says, You were dead through your trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the flesh and senses. We were made, hear this, by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy out of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, by the way, through our trespasses, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace, Paul says, you have been saved. Friends, ultimately, this is what Jesus' messages to his disciples 2,000 years ago was, and also to us today. Let me say it again. You are dead. You have no life in you, Jesus is saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Author, pastor, and college professor out of Yale in Connecticut, Matthew Krausman, says this. He says, in, in this teaching, Jesus' body becomes bread from heaven, divine provision to us in our time in the desert, and his blood becomes the atoning sacrifice. Moreover, his flesh and his blood become the force of life itself, the breath that calls our dead bodies into life. Friends, Jesus is the source of life we need, Matthew says. Without him, without taking him into our very bodies, we lie dead. With him, we have life and life eternal. Church simply said, Jesus, hear this, is the only way to finding life. Does this offend you? Jesus says of himself later in John's gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, absolutely no one comes to the Father except through me. You know, if we were to take a poll in our American society today on what statements people most like that Jesus shared, this one of claiming to be the only way to the Father would probably be at the bottom of that list, wouldn't it? I mean, people love some of what Jesus says. Like, like maybe number one would be, do not judge lest you be judged. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Number three, blessed are the poor. But again, to make the claim that he is the only way to God? I mean, so exclusive, so absolute, so not fair. In, in a culture that is full of diversity and differences, I mean, can Jesus really tell us that all people, no matter culture, gender, race, sexuality, past or present, can he really tell us that all people need the same thing? Him? I mean, how outrageous. Again, does this offend you? I think for some of us, really the offense of Jesus' words is that Jesus is the only way to finding life. Whereas for others of us, the offense is that Jesus is the only requirement. I mean, let's think about this. For some of us lifelong Christians, how preposterous a claim that a person who slides safe into heaven because of a deathbed conversion would get the same standing before God that we who have devoted our whole lives to following Jesus would get, right? Or how unfair it is for Jesus to lay claim that it is through him that access to heaven is received. What about the diversity of religious thought in our world today? It just isn't right. Yet, friends, Jesus is resilient on his claim. It is only through him that life is found. You know, as one who has grown up in the church, I have interacted with just a diversity of Christian denominations. And what I have found in my 40 years is that some believe that they have the corner on spiritual knowledge and the right way to heaven. Uh, let me give you an example. I remember during seminary, I was working with various churches to provide a, a collective community uh, ecumenical Good Friday service. And after sending out invitations to different churches to join us, one church actually took the time to write back saying this, and I quote, we will not water down our gospel message to work with you and your church. Man, what ego to fall into this belief that everyone needs what only we have. And whose gospel is it anyways? Is it ours or is it Jesus's? Listen, friends, hear me. We don't possess Jesus. It is he who gives us life, and what he gives us, we receive only as gift. Now, what we do or possess are really nothing more than I call them religious trappings, right? Those would be defined as our culture, our practices, our ethics, and our standards. And maybe for some of us, that's why we find this so offensive about Jesus' claim that he's the only requirement for eternal life, right? I mean, look, I get that we have to live out our faith in Christ with guiding principles. We all get that. 
We need to understand what the biblical standards are in order to pursue Christ on a deeper and more full level. That's why at Church of the Lakes, we push small group participation. We want everyone in our church faith family to understand from a biblical perspective the guiding principles for godly living. However, what can happen if we aren't caref- careful, friend, friends, is that we can make those guiding principles or those religious trappings the gateway to eternal life instead of just Jesus. I've heard it said over the years that, listen, we're not called to clean fish before we catch them. <laughs> nor do we give a laundry list of requirements to be a Christian. Hear me, there is only one requirement, and it is relationship with Jesus Christ. And how about the claim that Jesus is the only way? Does this offend you? You know, maybe you have a loved one who who doesn't believe in Jesus. Maybe you just feel that it it isn't okay to say that another religion or, or set of beliefs has got it wrong. You know, we live in a culture, and I think in some ways this is good, but we live in a culture where there is a a lot more sensitivity and consideration when it comes to to recognizing the differences and the diversity of people. Like, we don't like to say that other people are wrong or that they can't believe a certain way. Like I said, in some ways, this is a good thing. We have to be respectful to one another. However, again, in our current social climate— It is definitely offensive to tell people that Jesus is the only way to true life. I mean, doesn't it sound so judgmental and narrow-minded? But friends, hear me. We can't escape the fact that Jesus made this claim about himself, right? We didn't make it about him. No, he made it about himself. And if he said it, then we need to accept it, offensive or not. You know, both of these ideas that that Jesus is the only requirement and that he's the only way can cause us, I think, to feel a little uncomfortable and maybe even a little angry. You know, when you think about it, it it really boils down to fairness, doesn't it? Like, what we perceive to be fair on our own behalf and what we perceive to be fair on behalf of others. But listen, grace isn't fair, but it is good, amen? Amen. I, I want to end with a quote by Matthew Krausman, another quote. I love what he says. He says, Jesus' primary offense is that he says we need him, that apart from him there is no life in us. And the danger, the reason Jesus asks us this question point blank is this. If we get snagged on this offense, then we may never experience the life Jesus offers. Friends, I I bid you today, will you join me in laying down whatever your offense may be regarding the gospel? Lay it down and then join Jesus in the life he offers. I, I think if you do that, you will find that when the burden of offense is laid down, the weight of true life is so much easier to carry. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I just praise you in this moment that you truly are the one who brings life and life abundant to every single person who calls on your name. Lord, so often we get mixed up in, in, in cultural things or in religious things that we forget that you are the only way and you are the only requirement to finding life. So Lord, uh, this day in all of our homes as we gather for church, my prayer is that we claim the truth, that you are the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father but through you, Lord, and that we spend our days drawing more people, connecting more people to your Son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray all these things. Amen.